Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of J.S. Bach's Krell harmonizations. Today we're looking at Was betrubst du dich, mein Herz, which translates to Why are you saddened, my heart? Fairly straightforward Krell. Again, we have uh, something kind of interesting happening here in the... Um, second system in the hot spot where a lot of the uh, unusual or less typical things tend to happen um, coincidentally speaking because of how the scores end up being formatted but all in all fairly straightforward corral we're just going to hop right into the analysis so we have one flat in the key signature we start on g minor we end on g minor so i reckon we're in the key of g minor you might be thinking that because we don't have two flats in the key signature, maybe we're in the key of F major, but I find that in Bach's chorale writing especially, uh, the key signature tends to be more indicative of just how many flats get used in the overall work rather than um, just a, a key signature being thrown in there as a descriptor of the implied key for the entirety of the piece so it's very common for keys like c minor and g minor to have two flats and one flat respectively uh, you'll also see pieces in the key of g minor that have two flats you'll also see pieces in the key of c minor that have three flats it really just depends on how many accidentals end up getting used and whether or not is if, if it's better to use a key signature um, that probably means less handwriting for Bach. So that's my speculation about it. I don't know if there's any uh, documentation or um, you know, academic research into the topic, but that'd be kind of interesting if there were. So we start off with our tonic triad, little passing tones here in the inner voices. D and B flat are both chord tones. We then have G, E flat, A, and C. It's A minor 7 flat 5 over G. We would expect that to go to a D major chord in first inversion, which it does, F sharp, D, A, and C. It's D7 over F sharp, so four two chords typically resolve down by step in the bass, and they also typically have roots that are a fifth apart downwards, which is the case here, two goes to five, and we would expect that to go to one, which it does, G, D, G, and B flat. Nine eight suspensions here in the form of A are very common, um, especially over uh, tonic triads in root position. And then we get D, D, G, and A. Uh, it's kind of interesting here. There's a syncopation that creates a suspension here, but the G is a 4-3 suspension over the bass. They're, they're equally as common um, uh, suspensions uh, just in the case of root position dominant chords, whereas 9-8 suspensions are more common over tonic triads. Not always, but most commonly. We then have this little passing seventh here in the tenor, before we get G, B flat, D, and B flat, which is our tonic. Uh, D is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it. And also this G is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it as well. We also have a little passing seventh here before we get C, C, E flat, and A. Apologies for the typo here. I was confused about what this F natural was doing here, but turns out it's supposed to be an E flat instead. This is A diminished over C, it's 2-6. We know that Bach loves 2-6 six or 2-6-5 chords, especially in cadential situations. Passing tones in the melody and the tenor before we get 2-5 chords in anticipation for our half cadence. We have D, A, D, and F sharp, which is a D major in root position. And then we get another D major chord here just respelled. D, F sharp, A, and D. Next phrase also ends in a half cadence in the key of G minor. We start the phrase off with the G minor chord, G, G, B flat, and D. Tonic triad, root position, passing tones in the bass and the alto before we get B flat, G, D, and D, which is just taking our tonic triad and inverting it. No need to reiterate the Roman numeral. Passing seventh in the tenor, and uh, G is also a chord tone, so we don't have to mark that. Uh, we have C, E flat, G, and E flat, which is our four chord, C minor in root position, passing tone in the tenor. We also have D, which is a passing tone here in the bass, and C, which is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it. We then get E flat, C, 
G and C, which is just taking our C minor chord and inverting it. No need to reiterate the Roman numeral. A little delayed passing seventh here in the um, tenor as well before we get F sharp, A, A, and D. It's D major over F sharp, which is our dominant triad and first inversion. D is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it. Then we get G, D, A, and C. Kind of an interesting figure here. I think we have a double suspension here, where we have a 9-8 suspension over the bass, and a 4-3 suspension almost, or an accented non-chord tone that's operating like a 4-3 suspension uh, over the bass as well, where in reality, instead of getting G, D, A, and C, which isn't really a traditionally analyzable chord, a tertian chord, we have G, D, G, and B flat, which is our tonic triad and root position that then goes to 5. D, D, F sharp, and A, um, D major in root position. And then the next phrase is again another half cadence in the key of G minor, which is pretty interesting. We have another 5 chord here, D, A, F sharp, and D, no need to reanalyze. Then we get E flat, G, G, and C, which actually is the second chord and kind of an interesting progression here. This is 4, 6. And on the end of the beat, we have F sharp, which is a non chord tone, D, which is a non chord tone, and A, which is also a non chord tone, which gives us a subdivided chord progression of D7. It's 5, 6, 5 in the key of G minor. And this progression here of 5, 4, 6, 5, 6 is a particular pattern that we encounter quite frequently in box chorales. We see uh, typically two chords that share a Roman numeral, in this case 5 and 5, 6. They're usually separated by an inversion, and the chord that bridges the gap between them is a first inversion triad that is a diatonic step below the chords that share a Roman numeral. So usually we see this with one chords bridged by a seven chord in first inversion, but it's not uncommon to see four, three, six, four, six, or in this case, five, four, six, five, six, but one, seven, six, one, six is the most common variant of this chord progression by far, at least in my experience analyzing. So afterwards, we would expect our tonic triad, and we get that. We have G, D, G, and B flat. A is a 9 8 suspension over the bass. Again, 9 8 suspensions are really common over tonic triads and root position. And then we get D, D, G, and A. Also, just like we saw in our first phrase, in fact, this is very similar to what's happening in our first phrase. Um, Four three suspensions are equally common over root position dominant triads, and it's this voice leading that we see here in the alto that brings to light why that's the case. And then we get our tonic triad afterwards. We have G, D, G, and B flat, root position, passing seventh in the alto. And then we get a secondary dominant here in the form of C sharp, E, E, and A, which is uh, A major over C sharp. It's five six of five. Uh, this just sounds like a, a half cadence to me that's preceded by the secondary dominant rather than by two, but I really do like in the first phrase and the third phrase here in terms of what is effectively happening. It's just A major as a substitute for A diminished. It's just the difference between raising the E to E natural, which is what we have here, and the C to C sharp, but they share the same root, which means that they're typically moving the same place. And then after our five chord, we have... Um, a, which is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it, and G. Uh, actually, what's happening here is we are getting uh, 7, 6, 5 on the end of the beat. The chord is uh, respelled where the A gets replaced in the tenor, and uh, G is um, also added because of the redundant A, but we have a fully spelled uh, 7 chord here, and I think that um, sometimes we don't always get a fully spelled chord on the end of the beat when the chord is respelled, so I tend to mark those when I see them. And then we get D major, which is what we would expect after an A major chord usually. We have a D, A, D, and F sharp, which similarly to the first phrase gets respelled again. We have a D, F sharp, A, and D. No need to reanalyze. But the first perfect authentic cadence that we would see, we would expect it in the key of G minor. After all, the overall tonality of this chorale is G minor. 
but instead we get it in the key of B flat. And even though you could analyze this as a common chord modulation, when you have F sharp versus F natural here, with chords that share D in common, it really does feel like this is a direct modulation to B flat in my ears, but you could analyze this as a common chord if you um, will it that way. We start off with B flat major, B flat, F natural this time, uh, B flat, and D, which is our tonic triad. B flat is a chord tone, uh, D is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark either of those. And then we get B flat major again, B flat, D, F, and D. No need to reanalyze. Passing seventh in the bass, passing tone in the tenor here. And something that I was noticing on my second pass through of this particular chorale is that when we have the moving in the bass here, we have D, F, A, and C, which is D minor 7 over A, which happens to be a 3-4-3 three, three chord. And the reason why I feel like that's a little bit significant is because uh, 3 often goes to 4, and we have 4 happening on the end of the B, or the, sorry, the next B, G, B flat, G, and E flat, which is, um, like I said, our 4 chord, but happens to be in uh, first inversion. After our four chord, we get A, C, G, and C. I think this G is a 7-6 suspension over the bass, and this is actually F major over A, which would be our five chord in first inversion. And we would expect that to go to our tonic, which it does. We have B flat, C, F, and D. Another 9-8 suspension over our tonic triad and root position before we get F, B flat, F, and C. Another 4-3 suspension over our root position dominant triad. A little delayed passing seventh here. You could even call this a 5-7 chord, really, because there's a lot of counterpoint going on, and the seventh and the resolution to the suspension are within a sixteenth note of one another, but it is kind of a toss-up as to whether or not you want to include the seventh. Regardless, the five resolves to one, like we would expect in an authentic cadence, B flat, F, D, and B flat. In root position. Moving on to the next phrase, we stay in the key of B flat major. This one ends in a half cadence. We start off with another B flat major chord. We have B flat, D, F, and D. It's our tonic triad. Something to note is that even though we have the same Roman numeral on two consecutive beats, uh, unlike when they're on the same line where I'll omit the Roman numeral if it's the, the same, I'll reiterate it if there is a system break, just because it feels kind of weird to leave a blank spot on a new line. But similar to the progression we had here at the beginning of the previous phrase, we have some passing tones in the lower voices, which create A, C, F, and D, which is D minor 7 over A. That's a 3-4-3 three, three chord, and 3 often goes to 4. Typically, chord roots are either a fifth apart, or sorry, a fourth apart, or they are adjacent to one another. We do see thirds based progressions from time to time, but they're the least common relationship between chords that are next to one another in a progression. So 3-4-3 three, three happens to go to 4-6 again, just like it did in the previous um, in the previous phrase. G, B flat, G, and E flat. E flat major over G. And then we get D, B flat, F, and F, which um, I guess you could technically analyze as a D minor chord in root position, depending on how you look at how this B is operating here. I think this A is just a little neighbor tone, and this is actually B flat major over D, which is 1, 6. And then we get G, uh, B flat, G, and D, which is our 6 chord. As Just as I talk about how thirds based progressions are on the rare side, you know, uh, statistically speaking, they are, but we do see them from time to time, and especially between one chords and six chords. Passing seventh here in the alto before we get C, B flat, E flat, and E flat. Um, I do think this B flat is a 7 6 suspension over the bass, so you could analyze this as a 2 7 chord. Six does want to go to two after all. But I think the bigger picture here is we see that actually it's sort of like the idea of one chord either morphing into the other. Um, it doesn't really feel like a chord progression to me because two and seven are very close to one another, but they are a chord pairing that have uh, similar pitch content but different functions. So two 
typically operates as a predominant, not as a dominant chord, and 7 operates as a dominant chord because of the leading tone and where it wants to resolve. So I feel like the big picture here is that this B flat is really operating as, like I said, a 7 6 suspension, and this is actually a 7 6 chord, a diminished over C, which we would then see resolve to a uh, B flat major chord. Um, which I feel makes more sense narratively speaking, but you could analyze this as a 2-7 progression if you felt uh, compelled to do so. You wouldn't be wrong. It just I feel like the big picture here is that this is just a big 7 chord. But yes, on the next B, we do get our 1 chord. It happens to be in first inversion, D, B flat, F, and D. A little passing tone in the bass here before we get F, A, F, and D. Actually, F, B flat, F, and D, which is taking our tonic triad and inverting it to second inversion. And then we get A and C on the end of the beat, which turns the chord into a five chord, F major, which gives us a one, six, four, five progression here that turns into this uh, similar profile that we've seen, not just in this crowd, but a ton of other crowds in the past where the final cadential chord will be uh, repeated twice. So really the cadence consists of either these two beats or these three beats, however you want to think about it. Um, but the final cadential chord will just be respelled on the um, on the final beat of the phrase. This phrase right here is probably the most interesting phrase. Uh, it ends in a half cadence in the key of B flat major again. However, there's some interesting tonicization of G going on here. Even though G really isn't the object of like the, the tonic object of the phrase in both instances, and we'll talk about that when we get there. So the phrase starts off with another five chord, F, A, F, and C, with a passing seventh in the bass, no need to reanalyze. We then have a B flat major again, D, B flat, F, and D. It's in first inversion. This E flat's almost like taking the four chord, or sorry, the five chord and putting it in uh, third inversion, which makes sense because it resolves to a tonic triad in first inversion. After our 1-6 chord, we get kind of a similar situation to what happened uh, here in this, wait, sorry, what happened, where was it? Here, on the first beat of the uh, previous measure, we have C, B flat, G, and E flat, which potentially has um, room to be analyzed as a 2-7 chord. However, I think the big picture here is that this B-flat is a 7-6 suspension over the bass, and um, by virtue of that, I feel like the chord is really happening on the end of the beat, and coincidentally, this G would also be a, an accented non-chord tone if that were the fact. So really what I think is happening here is um, F-sharp, A, C, and E-flat, which in this case would be 7-4-3 of 6, because F sharp is the um, leading tone to G, and G is our six in the key of G minor. Sorry, my headphone cable snuck into the frame there because it is not currently tucked down. Um, apologies if that was distracting there. Um, but afterward, but this makes sense because it ends up resolving to a six chord anyways. G, B flat, G, and D. And just to reiterate about chord morphing is what I've kind of been calling it for lack of a, a better term or a more conventional term. I feel like when you have chords that are similar in terms of pitch content that happen over the span of one beat, I feel like really what's happening is that there's counterpoint that coincidentally presents both chords, but it makes more sense, narratively speaking, to look at the bigger picture in terms of what's happening on the harmonic rhythm. So sometimes subdivided chord progressions happen. They happen quite frequently, but I think it's more common for something like this to uh, occur and you can be granular with it and analyze what's happening on both beats. But if the chords are similar in terms of their pitch content, it feels like less of a chord progression is happening and more like look, there's like a fluctuation from chord to, um, to uh, chord. It might sound like I'm saying the same thing, like what it, a chord progression is just a fluctuation from one chord to the next, but I feel like there is usually in a chord progression enough variation between the chords that are uh, happening in progression to uh, to create the progression itself, whereas what's happening here doesn't really feel like a progression. It feels like more counterpoint. The voices are contributing 
to the chord from more of a melodic standpoint, which is where the morphing comes from. But yeah, I talk about it at length in my uh, previous videos as well, so if you want to check those out, you can as well, and you might encounter me talking about that. But regardless, after a six chord, this is where it gets kind of interesting, because here we're definitely tonicizing six, but here we're not. It makes me wonder what this F sharp is doing here. It sounds like we're trying to allude to G minor, but B flat is still definitely the tonic. We also have another chromatic bass line here. Or wait, is this the first one? No, this is the first chromatic bass line. We have another one later in the chorale. We have E flat, C, G, and C, which I think is just a regular C minor chord in first inversion. We know that Bach loves two six chords, especially in cadential contexts, but if you look at this F sharp as the uh, chord tone here, where I think it's just a chromatic neighbor tone, which is interesting. Uh, I think you could analyze this as F sharp. Um, I mean, you could technically analyze this as F sharp diminished seventh over E flat, but because there's no third in the chord, it doesn't really make a ton of sense for that to be the case. This G kind of, I guess, looks like a like a what like a ten nine suspension, even if that were the case. Yeah, I think this F sharp is just an interesting chromatic neighbor tone. It'd make more sense from a B flat perspective if this were an F natural, but it is an F sharp, and it does tonicize the um, in this case the fifth of the chord, which I think is pretty interesting. We get little chromatic tones like that from time to time in Bach, but they are on the extremely rare side. But afterwards, we get this chromatic bass line here, and we see two morph into E, C, G, and C with this delayed passing seventh in the melody. That's C major over E, which is the dominant of our dominant, 5, 6, of 5. And then the phrase ends with this similar sort of third motion that we've seen in two phrases previously with this uh, repeated 5 chord. Also kind of what's going on here in the um, previous phrase as well. This is F major. F, C, F, and A. And then it gets repeated again. Uh, F, A, C, and F. And similarly to how we went to the key of um, B flat major, I think we get another um, modulation, a direct modulation that is to the key of G minor. Something about uh, F natural versus F sharp happening in such close proximity to one another. It's interesting how Bach off, uh, it, it actually quite often he'll find ways between par uh, not parallel, relative keys, G and B flat sharing a key signature. He finds a way to make them sound somewhat foreign to one another because of the way that he juxtaposes the chords. There's plenty of common chords between the two keys. There's uh, A diminished, there is uh, C minor, there is E flat major, of course, there's G minor and B flat major as well. The majority of the chords are diatonic to one another, but here we see um, B flat ma or sorry F major against D major, and here we see D major against B flat major. So chords that are a third apart, coincidentally, are the ones that are kind of uh, somewhat foreign to one another. But regardless, we start with our five chord and first inversion. Here we have F sharp, A, A. And D, it's D major over F sharp, neighbor tones in the alto and the bass before we get the same chord again, except we get a, a vocal swap between the melody and the bass here with a D and A. Uh, D is a chord tone, so we don't have to mark it. And then we get G, D, G, and B flat with a 9 8 suspension over the bass here in the alto, very common over root position tonic triads. and on the same side of that, or almost the same side of that coin, maybe the flip side of the coin actually, we have a 4-3 suspension here over our dominant triad and root position, D, D, F sharp, and A. Sorry, I forgot to mark the tonic triad there. I was talking about it and didn't actually mark it. But as we get ready for our half cadence here, which is actually kind of a special half cadence, it's a Phrygian half cadence, um, we have G, D, G, and B flat root position tonic triad, passing seventh from the bass, and then we get E flat, E flat, G, and C, which is a C minor in first inversion, 4-6. This is our typical Phrygian half cadence chord. We do see situations where other chords could be extrapolated from the texture. We see 2-4-3 chords, we see root position 6 chords, often 6-7 chords, which is kind of interesting, but 
always there's a 4-6 chord lingering. So usually my argument is that the 4-6 chord is the chord that's being implied there despite the counterpoint due to the fact that 4-6 when we do see Phrygian half cadences like this one, the fact that 4-6 is the chord that is just right there on the beat preceding our 5 chord makes sense that it's probably an implied 4-6 chord. Uh, and then we have D major, D, A, F sharp, and D with this interesting, uh, what is that, a tritone leap, a diminished fifth here in the tenor, which is uh, kind of cool. Um, typically, voice leading rules and practices would tell you, don't do that. That would be points off of your assignment if you're taking a Western theory class. Uh, so yeah, don't do what Bach does. And the end of the chorale ends with a perfect authentic cadence like we would expect. We then have a G minor chord that sort of resolves this half cadence. G, B flat, G, and D. We then get B flat, D, G, and D, which just takes our uh, G minor chord and inverts it. No need to reiterate the Roman numeral. And then we get C, E flat, G, and C which is C minor in root position, that is our four chord. Then we get some neighbor tones happening here in the inner voices, which actually gives us, um, I'm not gonna write that because uh, it's not really a fully voiced chord, but we sort of had this allusion to D7 here with C, uh, D, and F sharp, but typically on the end of the beat, if the chord isn't fully voiced, uh, meaning that all of the chord tones are present, um, I won't mark it, but the great thing about the video is that I can talk about it, and then if you wanted to be that granular, you could analyze this as a 5-7 chord in third inversion. It just doesn't really make a ton of sense, um, especially the way that the bass resolves. Typically, if there's one thing about a 4-2 chord, which this would be, this would be a 4-2 a chord, a 5-4-2 chord in this case, it would resolve down by step, and it doesn't. It's actually part of a chromatic bass line. So chromatic bass lines often introduce interesting things, but ascending chromatic bass lines especially are not usually that remarkable. It's usually a secondary leading tone that connects these uh, two outer voices. They're not the outer voices, but these two um, notes on either side of the chromatic passing tone usually connects them by the leading tone of the third note in the, uh, in the sequence in this case. But regardless, C sharp, E, G and B flat, that's C sharp fully diminished seventh in root position, which is seven seven of five. That takes us to five D A G and A, another four three suspension over a root position dominant triad. That's fairly common, like we've seen in this chorale in particular. We then have uh, D, which is a chord tone, we don't have to mark it. F sharp has the resolution. E is a little, well actually F sharp is sort of like an anticipation to the resolution. I'd say the resolution happens on beat two. E is a little enclosure around the F sharp. We have uh, D, D, F sharp, and A, which is another five chord. Um, C is a little delayed passing seventh. G is an anticipation. And then the chorale ends with a minor tonic triad, which is atypical. We typically expect major tonic triads at the end of our minor chorales, but we see here that Bach breaks that convention that he sort of established for himself. We see it with a, with, with, with a bit of regularity, so I wouldn't call it a convention, but it's definitely a stylistic thing that we could expect Bach to do at the end of his minor chorales. But that's today's analysis. I think the big takeaways from this chorale, um, at least the ones that I have in my notes, are the uh, double suspension that we saw earlier. We have this tonic triad here where we have a G, D, A. This A is a 9-8 suspension that resolves down to G. And this C right here, which sort of operates as a 4-3 suspension. Um, we see the resolution happening at the same time. It's always really cool when we see sort of these organic suspensions that Bach capitalizes upon in the melody, because as we already know, Bach is harmonizing the melody. Usually the melody is already composed for Bach, which is uh, which means that it's sort of like a puzzle for him to create music like this, which is pretty neat. We have the 5-4-6-5-6 five, six, five, six progression, which is an interesting variation on the pattern that I talked about. You can uh, rewind to earlier in the video when I talk about that. Um, we have uh, this idea of uh, this maybe potential, uh, if this were, 
a 542 chord here the fact that this 542 could be resolving irregularly i talked about it just a couple of minutes ago i don't think that's likely happening but the fact that the chord is there is kind of interesting that it's being um, contextualized in this way with the double neighbor tones happening in the inner voices and then our chromatic bass lines which are always interesting uh, here at the end of the chorale and also this chromatic bass line with the e flat the e natural and the uh, f going on here in the cadence of this chorale uh, or sorry this phrase but other than that i think those are the big takeaways and i'm going to cap the video off on those thoughts if you're interested in following me along on the journey to analyze all of Bach's chorale harmonizations feel free to subscribe to the channel you can hit the notification icon and like the video as well if you enjoyed the content thank you so much for watching the video and supporting the channel by doing so i look forward to tomorrow's analysis and i hope you take care